Good morning. My name is Bharat Gopalaswamy, and I direct the South Asia Center. On behalf of my executive leadership and my colleagues, I am pleased to welcome you to this important event, Dispute and Focus, Pakistan's Perspectives in Kashmir. Um, you all have been following the news the last uh, month, month and a half, and I don't need to remind you how important this subject and this topic particularly is. And we are very pleased to li listen uh, from Senator Mushahid Hussain Syed and Senator uh, Shazra Mansab Khan. Uh, Senator Mushahid Hussain Syed is the chairman of uh, the Senate's Defense Committee and is a specialist on international political and strategic issues. He's, he's Prime Minister Nawaz Sharif, special envoy on Kashmir, and he's just begun his visit um, from this Sunday. And so is um, uh, Member of Parliament Shashra Mansab Khan. The way we will proceed today is I will invite uh, Senator Mushahid Hussain Syed to deliver his remarks, and this will be followed by Member of Parliament Shazra Mansab Khan, and subsequently we'll engage in a moderated discussion um, until maximum until 11.30, after which uh, you're free to engage with them on the sidelines and offline about their views and perspectives on this subject. So I do not want to take much of your time, and I know this is a very important issue, and we go right to the heart and the source of this issue. I've been in India, Pakistan, and Afghanistan over the last three weeks, and I've um, had the pleasure and the privilege of speaking to people there, but I will um, I will raise those issues and um, um, those perspectives during the question and answer session. But first, we'd, we'd welcome Senator Mushahid Hussain Syed to the stage to deliver his remarks. Thank you. Sorry, and before I begin, this session is on the <coughs> record, and when you, when you want to raise a question, please identify yourself and your affiliation before you raise the question so that we're, you know where you're coming from. Uh, in the name of the Almighty, the Lord of all mankind, good morning and assalamu alaikum. It's a great pleasure to be here at the Atlantic Council, and I'm very grateful to the Atlantic Council, especially Dr. Bharat Gopalaswamy, to invite uh, my colleague, Dr. Shadra Ali, member of parliament from Pakistan, uh, and she represents the constituency uh, which is called Nankana Saab, which is the holiest of the holy sites for the Sikh community. And she is the elected representative from that constituency, having won that seat. And it was very brave on her part to contest that very somewhat conservative constituency in central Punjab of province of Pakistan. And she won uh, by 80,000 votes. And she and I have been uh, uh, asked to represent Pakistan uh, on the issue of Kashmir and on Pakistan-India relations. Uh, basically, before I go into that issue, I'd just like to give you a brief context. And also, I would like to recognize my former colleague, Dr. Akbar Khaja. Uh, he was senator. And uh, also, before that, he, we were teaching together in the Punjab University in Lahore. And we got thrown out together because we were supposed to be leftists in the days of Jalan Zia. <laughs> but he joined, came to Washington, joined the World Bank, and I left Washington from Georgetown University and joined uh, journalism. But it's good that uh, uh, we are to see you, sir. Uh, a brief context is necessary about Pakistan so that you know that context defines uh, what is happening vis-a-vis -vis my country and the region that Pakistan is located. Uh, the region where Pakistan is located, Pakistan, Afghanistan, South Asia, even now Central Asia, that has been in the eye of the storm since 1979. Since 79 was important because that was when the Soviet military intervention took place in Afghanistan and Pakistan was transformed into a frontline state uh, with the backing of the Western countries, the international community, the Muslim world, and a long drawn war took place. So since that period, since 79 to date, that region where Pakistan is located has seen three Afghan wars. The first one, Afghan 
jihad, as they call it then. Now jihad is no longer a popular term, but I still recognize President Reagan as the greatest jihadi of the 20th century because he was the one who welcomed uh, Mr. Haqqani, the, I'm not talking of Mr. Hussain Haqqani, I'm talking of Jalaluddin Haqqani, the famous uh, Afghan leader, Gulbadin Hekmachar, others were welcomed to the White House, and they were hailed as freedom fighters like the founding fathers of America. Then uh, $2.1 billion of CIA funds was pumped in through Pakistan to train 200,000 Afghan Mujahideen and 20,000 Arab volunteers, including a gentleman by the name of Mr. Osama bin Laden. And then matching funds of $2.1 billion was provided by the Saudis. So that became $4.2 billion. And then the billion dollars came from other sources, China, etc. So $5.2 billion was pumped into the region, Pakistan, Afghanistan, from 79 to 89. And so that is, uh, and then the war. We have also seen three Gulf Wars during that period. Iran, Iraq War, Gulf War I, Gulf War II. Then we have seen three near wars between India and Pakistan. 87, brass tax, 99, Kargil, then 2002. So, and then we are seeing an ongoing proxy war in the Muslim world, which is intra-Muslim world. So that the whole area, uh, as it were, if it's volatile, it's unstable, Pakistan, Afghanistan, we have been in the eye of the storm. And now we see, uh, hopefully, this post-9-11 uh, transition in the region, which is very, very important. And for that post-9-11 transition, it's important that the baggage of history be cleared, issues be resolved according to universally accepted principles, and some sort of enduring peace, security, and stability be established so that one-fifth of humanity that resides in South Asia, some of the best and the brightest human resources are living in India, in Pakistan, in Bangladesh, in Sri Lanka, in Nepal, in the Maldives, in Bhutan, all these places. That uh, talent, that creativity is allowed to blossom. And... Uh, one aspect of the emerging Pakistani profile is very important is that now we have multiple power structure centers in Pakistan. Pakistan has been fighting the longest and the largest inland war on terrorism, and by far the most successful one, more successful than what the US tried to do and failed in Afghanistan and Iraq. And we have paid a heavy price for that, 60,000 soldiers, civilian in Pakistan martyred, and, but we have achieved notable success in that. We are still hosting about 3 million Afghan refugees, which is the longest and the largest refugee population in uh, modern times to be in any country as of today. And uh, in that context, we, uh, we uh, see Pakistan as being the freest Muslim democracy. So in multiple power centers, we have the military establishment, which has been there. Then there's the political establishment, which includes Dr. Shazra Ali and myself, political parties, parliament. Then we have a very independent judiciary now, the Supreme Court, the high courts, which are on nobody's control. They are independent, and they take decisions according to their own judgment of the situation on merits. Then we have a fiercely independent media. 50 privately owned news and entertainment channels in Pakistan, in all languages of Pakistan. Urdu, Punjabi, Balochi, Pashto, Sindhi, as well as English, which is the official language. And anything goes, there are no holy cows when it comes to discussions and talk shows. Over 100 FM radio stations, privately owned, in all languages, all over Pakistan. 200 million population, 65% of Pakistanis are under the age of 35, so we have a youth bulge. 110 million people have access to cell phones. 50 million have access to internet, social media, Twitter, Facebook, etc. 
So that is what we are talking about, this emerging Pakistan. And in this context, the parliament has emerged as also a major factor on issues of national security. And a lot of issues of national security are now referred to parliament to decide. I'll just give you two examples of that. In 2001, uh, 11, in November 2011, there was the incident of Salala, where there was an American attack on a Pakistani post. And uh, it was the time of the previous government, the Pakistan People's Party government. The issue was referred to the Parliamentary Committee on National Security, and they decided on the terms of engagement. Last year, there was an issue of troops, whether they should be sent to Yemen. And it was referred to the parliament. And we took the decision. I was involved in both decisions as member of the Parliamentary Committee on National Security, and as one who drafted the resolution also. So parliament is a factor now in uh, issues of foreign policy and national security, which wasn't the case before. And I think that and their decisions are accepted and respected. Coming to the region, I just want to mention two brief trends which are important in the context. One is a new regionalism is developing in our region, driven by economy and energy, ports and pipelines, roads and railways. And I now call it Greater South Asia. When we used to talk of South Asia, it was just Pakistan, India, Bangladesh, Sri Lanka, Nepal, the Maldives, and Bhutan. That is no longer the case. Now we have a geoeconomic element called Greater South Asia, which includes South Asia, which includes China, which includes Myanmar, which includes Iran, which includes Afghanistan, which includes the Central Asian republics, Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan, Uzbekistan, Tajikistan, Turkmenistan, woven together by this cooperation. And in that, pipelines are very important. There is the Iran-Pakistan pipeline. It used to be the Iran-Pakistan-India pipeline. But then India then backed off under American pressure under the government of Mr. Manmohan Singh. Then there is the Turkmenistan-Afghanistan-Pakistan-India pipeline, TAPI. Then there's the Qatar pipeline. Then there are pipelines with China and uh, the Central Asian Republics. Was Kazakhstan documented that this current phase of the uprising is purely indigenous. In fact, uh, I was reading an article by my friend from India, Raj Mohan Gandhi, who is the grandson of the Mahatma Gandhi. On the 18th of September, I think, in the Hindu, he said, there is a de facto plebiscite taking place in Kashmir, Indian occupied Kashmir. A de facto plebiscite. The people have revolted, facing bullets and pellets. And unfortunately, the government in India seems to keen to deflect attention from their own feelings in Indian occupied Kashmir and put the onus on Pakistan by raising temperatures. And that policy, I think, has been counterproductive for India. Uh, you can see in the context of uh, their recent agreement with America for providing access to the Pentagon to land, air, and sea bases on 31st of uh, August, there has been a reaction from the Russian side. There has been a uh, slower but sure rapprochement between Moscow and Islamabad. As we speak today, Russian army is conducting military exercises with the Pakistan army in Pakistan territory for the first time in our relations with Moscow. And for also for the first time, Russia has agreed to sell arms to Pakistan, despite Indian objections, overriding the Indian objections, because Russia has been a long-standing ally uh, of India. So that's a very major development. India, Mr. Modi made some remarks on Balochistan, forgetting that Balochistan is a province which is Pakistan uh, shares with Iran. And any uh, in destabilization there affects Iran also. And when the Iranian president 
Mr. Rouhani met Prime Minister Nawaz Sharif on 22nd September in New York. He said the security of Pakistan is the security of Iran. The first time Iran has made that statement and that we would like to have close cooperation between the Gwadar port and the port of Chabahar in uh, Iran. And in this context, in this new emerging uh, regionalism, I'd like just to, to mention that China is a major factor now because there's the China-Pakistan Economic Corridor and CPEC. And you mentioned I'm chairman of the Defense Committee. I'm also chairman of the Parliamentary Committee on the China-Pakistan Economic Corridor, which is an important committee which includes both Houses of Parliament, National Assembly and Senate. And uh, the China-Pakistan Economic Corridor is the biggest bilateral development initiative between any two countries. $46 billion spread over 15 countries, 15 years, 2015 to 2030, having four components. The process had been initiated earlier of cooperation and because that on China there's a consensus, the Pakistan People's Party played a leading role also in the past, and the other parties are also supporting it. The four components include infrastructure, energy, the development of Gwadar port. Gwadar port is in uh, the southern Pakistan province of Balochistan on the Arabian Sea. And if you want to know more about Gwadar port, I would refer you to a very interesting article by Robert Kaplan in the May 2009 issue of the Atlantic magazine which is published from Washington. And he had said that Gwadar is the hub of a new emerging Silk Road, and it has the potential to be the Rotterdam of the Arabian Sea. With an outreach, which he talked of uh, Gwadar goods from Gwadar going to Samarkand, the historic city of Uzbekistan, and linking them through land routes with Xinjiang province, with uh, uh, Samarkand in uh, Uzbekistan, with Bishkek in Kyrgyzstan, with Almaty and Astana in Kazakhstan, in Dushanbe in Tajikistan, and Ashgabad in Turkmenistan. So this kind of connectivity, uh, because Central Asia is land landlocked. So, and the fourth component is uh, special economic zones and uh, industrial parks. So when we come to uh, Pakistan-India relations, I think it's very important that the US, the American policymakers take note of that. Because we see that, uh, unfortunately, under the Obama administration, there was a drift in American foreign policy towards our region, towards Afghanistan and Pakistan. There was confusion. And there, was, there were a lot of flip-flops. I think the Obama administration could not figure out this region. Uh, Afghanistan and Pakistan, and as a consequence, this region suffered with policies that were one step back, one step, announcing a surge, announcing a cutoff time for exit, then asking sometimes Pakistan that please, we want to talk to the Taliban, then saying we want to take on the Taliban, and finally then they say we are, there will be no American troops there. And then they end up having now 8,500 troops still stationed. And so it leaves it to the next administration. But the key element which indicates that the United States has long-term interests in the region is that the two biggest American embassies in the world are going to be in Kabul and Islamabad, respectively. Huge embassies. So that obviously means that the US presence is important. It is there. And the US has legitimate interests, and we feel that the U.S. interest should look at the region as a whole, whether it's Pakistan, India, China, Afghanistan, and there's a plus also, the Iran nuclear deal with the Iran also, because all these countries can contribute to stability and security of the region. And what uh, Pakistan would like from the United States, and I'm talking of the incoming administration, because Mr. Obama is a guest for the next few months, uh, then. 20th of January 2017, there'll be a new administration, that they have to see the region where they have a more comprehensive perspective and do not try to compartmentalize peace 
and security, because that is not possible. If you talk of peace in Kabul, you have to ensure that Kashmir is not burning. And the United States has a long-standing interest in Kashmir. They are a party to the United Nations resolutions. Admiral Nimitz was the first plebiscite administrator, a war hero of the US. Avril Harriman, one of the most distinguished scions of American diplomacy, was uh, uh, one of the mediators in 1960s. So given those legitimate interests, and the US has played a very positive role in supporting oppressed people, oppressed Muslims, I would say, Bosnia, Kosovo, even the Kurds. So Kashmiris today should not suffer just because Kashmir has no oil, or Kashmir is not part of Europe, or Kashmiris belong to a certain religious denomination, because we cannot have double standards on those issues here. And in, for Pakistan, we have a long-standing engagement with the United States, and we would like that. But of course, we have options also. Uh, with the greater Russian involvement in the region, they are also interested in coming into CPAC through Gazprom. Then uh, Iran, Turkey, and Saudi Arabia have also expressed an interest in joining CPAC. So this region, South Asia, needs a way forward to ensure uh, some sort of uh, durable settlement. And I think three components of the way forward are very important. The first is human rights. The sufferings of the Kashmiri people must be alleviated immediately. The Human Rights Council, of the, which is the body of the United Nations, has already asked for sending a fact-finding mission to Indian occupied Kashmir. We said we also welcome it in our Azad Kashmir. They should be sent. There should not be an impediment. When Dr. Shazra Ali and myself presented the dossier on human rights, and uh, my colleague had very meticulously worked on that also, and we presented it. She, and we said to the State Department that we hope that that dossier would find resonance in the upcoming State Department human rights report. And we say that there are three parties to the dispute, Pakistan, India, and the people of Jammu and Kashmir. And without the involvement of the three parties, there can be no forward movement. And the bottom line is that the status quo is untenable, unacceptable to the people of Kashmir, as Raj Mohan Gandhi has said. So the human rights dimension is the first one, because Kashmir is not about territorial real estate. It's about its brave and oppressed people. And that is the focus, number one. Number two, Pakistan-India relations. There have to be dialogue. In this, the Simla agreement called for a dialogue issues. India has spurned that offer. We said, let's talk in the regional framework. At least there's a communication and contact through SARC, the South Asian Association of Regional Cooperation. That has been undermined by India. Sabot the SARC summit was sabotaged by India. Not for the first time, but I think fourth or fifth time. Then there's the international dimension, the international community. The last United Nations resolution referring to Kashmir was passed unanimously on June 6, 1998. Please note, June 6, 1998, resolution number 1172. 1172. It condemned the nuclear tests of India and Pakistan, but at the same breath, it said that it is incumbent to resolve the root causes of tension, i.e. Kashmir. That is the last. So we're not talking of resolutions in 1948, 1949. I'm talking of resolution 1172, June 6, 1998. That says very specifically. So let us focus on that. Issues cannot be brushed under the carpet. The Americans thought after 89, Afghanistan is off the radar screen. Those who have seen Charlie Wilson's war will see that, that they, they were not interested. The issue came back with a bang after 9-11. They thought after the Gulf War of 1991, Iraq was off the radar screen. The issue came back with a bang in 2003. People thought the Kashmir issue is suppressed and buried. It's come back with a bang. And it's more significant because you're dealing 
as President Clinton called it in 1993, a nuclear flashpoint, potential nuclear flashpoint. Two nuclear neighbors, we should learn to talk to each other rather than talk at each other. I'm so glad that in the last two days there have been positive developments. The National Security Advisors of India and Pakistan have communicated twice on their hotline. There is, and both have sought the diffusion of tensions. We welcome that. If there are issues, there should be a public investigation and inquiry into that. And we feel that uh, the way forward, finally, I would like to say internationally is that the region calls for statesmanship and what I call a Nixonian transformation of Mr. Modi. That if he can have that outreach and develop that statesmanship, which Richard Nixon demonstrated in 1971, courtesy Pakistan, when Dr. Kissinger flew on the secret mission from across the Karakums from Islamabad to Beijing, and the world was no longer the same. So I think the options are there, the opportunities are there. It was the Latin saying, carpe diem, seize the moment. I, I think it's time for our leadership, whether it's civil or military, our entire parliament, we are ready for that. The ball is in Mr. Modi's court. Can he rise to the occasion as the leader of 1.2 billion people to build a better and peaceful tomorrow for the teeming millions of South Asia and a future without any overlords and without any underdogs? Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Unfortunately, we don't have a live telecast, and if there was a live telecast, and if Mr. Modi was watching this, I'm sure he'd be pleased to listen to this. He would have tweeted immediately. He would have tweeted immediately. And I would have responded to the tweet. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. I have a lot of questions, but I will wait for your colleague uh, yes. to deliver her remarks. Uh, please, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Uh, I would just like to talk. Uh, my colleague, Senator Mushahid Hussain, has given a very a comprehensive uh, account of the present situation, the regional situation. I would like to talk about the human rights uh, violations that are occurring in Kashmir right now. Um, I'm sure that most of you must be aware of the historical context of uh, the dispute uh, of Kashmir. Uh, but just to uh, remind ourselves, I would like to begin by saying that the uh, India took this dispute to the United Nations. India was the one which took this dispute in 1948 to the United Nations asking for a free and fair plebiscite so that the people of the country, the people of the area could have the right to self-determination which is uh, enshrined in the Charter of the United Nations. So after 1948, Kashmir is no longer a local uh, issue. It is an international issue. It is an international di uh, a dispute. And this is something that we all need to recognize and keep reminding ourselves. The two resolutions of 1948 and 1949 clearly state that the people of Kashmir must be, after some preconditions have been met, must be given the right to self-determination. And after that, there have been a series of uh, uh, United Nations resolutions. The current situation in Kashmir, there have always been uh, <coughs> what we would call freedom fighters in Kashmir. Every new generation that wakes up to the broken promises of the United Nations and of the international community rises and asks for uh, the fundamental right to self-determination. There's, a, there's fear in the Kashmiri people that India might be trying to change the demographic uh, situation of Kashmir, and that is something that is, that is very a, a tangible fear in the people of Kashmir. On July 8th, the extrajudicial uh, killing of Burhan Wani spurred this uh, indigenous uprising in Kashmir where the youth of Kashmir, people between 15 and 20, uh, 25 years of age are the ones who are on the roads with stones in their hands asking for the right to self-determination. There are 700,000 troops, military and paramilitary troops at this point in the Kashmir Valley, which makes it a ratio of uh, one soldier to seven uh, uh, civilians. And the Indian troops 
have been using pellet guns to quell uh, the peaceful protests, which is a fundamental right, which is an inalienable right of the Kashmiri people to ask for the right to choose their own destiny. Pellet guns have traditionally been used for deer hunting. And each uh, shot of a pellet gun showers a, a, a whole, a, a, it, it's like shrapnel. Thousands of pieces of shrapnel enter the human body. This has been shot indiscriminately at women, at children, at men, old people. Uh, it has, the use of this uh, has not only killed and maimed and incapacitated people, uh, they have suffered debilitating injuries which will stay with them for the rest of their lives. More than 150 people have been blinded by the use of these pellet guns. More than 150 people. More than 700 people have been partially blinded. Many people were sitting in their homes. They were not even outside. They were not even in there. They were not even on the roads. I would like to give the example. I will, I will just show you the, the picture of this girl. She was, she was sitting in her home when pellet guns were fired at her. And after this, after the presentation, uh, you can take a look. There's, there are more pictures of what happens when pellet guns are fired. Pellet guns are now banned even for uh, animal hunting. But the Indian troops continue to use them. The day that we arrived on Sunday, we met with a few doctors who had recently been to Kashmir. And they were telling us eyewitness accounts of what they had seen. Then there is no recourse to emergency services. There is a very strict curfew, almost now for the past three months. And uh, so the, the Kashmiri people do not have recourse to any medical treatment. Tear gas shelling continues on ambulances and even in hospitals in Kashmir. So the, 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 the wounded and the injured, first of all, cannot find their way to the hospitals. And even if they do, if, even if uh, they do reach the hospitals, there is uh, uh, no uh, medical facilities available. Doctors are there, these brave doctors who continue to stay there, who continue uh, to uh, take out one piece of this tiny shrapnel from the human body. It sometimes takes them more than three hours. And you can imagine the whole body full of shrapnel. There are pictures. The, this is well documented by international media as well, the Washington Post, the New York Times, and other um, uh, international media have documented these facts. So we are talking here about facts. Uh, there are no food supplies now reaching Kashmir. Uh, it's very difficult to enter the valley of Kashmir. A, a sort of a visa is required, and it's very difficult to procure. And uh, so there, there are no food supplies, most, most importantly, no medical facilities. The United Nations and the United States as a permanent member of the United Nations Security Council needs to come to the fore, needs to make sure that its own resolutions are implemented, which asks for a free and fair, fair plebiscite for the people of Kashmir. One thing is sure now, the youth that is out, the youth that, that is out on the streets that is asking for its right to freedom, they are not going to acquiesce in the status quo. Pakistan is not going to acquiesce in the status quo. These human rights violations, these gross, grave, state-sponsored human rights violations need to be stopped. These are innocent people. And their call for freedom cannot be suppressed by the use of brute force that India is doing right now. So these resolutions that have been passed by the United Nations Security Council, uh, Pakistan, the Prime Minister, <coughs> uh, Mia Mohammed Nawaz Sharif, has asked for India to come to the negotiating table 
this is the only way out. We sit. There should be no precondition to the negotiation. The only precondition that Pakistan asks for is that this human rights violation need to stop and they need to stop immediately. This is not about territory. For Pakistan, this is not a war about territory. It is about giving the Kashmiri people their right, their right to vote, their right to freedom. And let me quote a few examples of, of, of recent uh, United Nations uh, resolutions that have actually uh, resulted in freedom. For example, East Timor, where there were two resolutions in 1975 and 1976. And in 1999, a plebiscite was held under the UN auspices, and East Timor gained independence from Indonesia. The same is the case with South uh, Sudan. So why cannot the people of Kashmir get that right? Why cannot the people of Kashmir be allowed to choose their own destiny? And so the prime minister <coughs> of Pakistan and we as a special envoy, first of all, we would like, we would urge the international community to make sure that medical equipment uh, reaches uh, in Kashmir and the best, and especially for those people that have been blinded and partially blinded, they need urgent medical help. And we ask for the curfew to be lifted, for the peaceful, for, to allow the peaceful protests to continue. And then we ask for India to come to the negotiating table to talk about the uh, the way forward, what can be done, what can be done to ensure that a free and fair plebiscite is held in Kashmir. And I think that is uh, the only uh, uh, the only way, the, uh, the only other way is uh, a war. And we must remember that India and Pakistan are, are, are uh, vulnerable to each other's nuclear capabilities. Uh, none of the citizens of India and Pakistan want war. Pakistan and India do not want war. And there have been intellectuals in India, for example, Aranduti Rai, who have called for these, uh, uh, this situation to be looked into, who has, who has uh, pointed out the fascist tendencies that, unfortunately, um, uh, Prime Minister Modi has time and again uh, evinced. And uh, 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 intellectuals like Noam Chomsky have uh, asked the international media and the international, uh, uh, the, the United Nations to intervene. We are grateful to the United Nations General Secretary who has uh, offered his good services and uh, Pakistan Prime Minister has accepted them. Unfortunately, India has uh, again repeated the long history of um, going back on its word starting from Indira Gandhi, uh, before that uh, in Ayub Khan's uh, uh, time also, and continuing up till now, there have been so many um, uh, times when we've, start, we've talk, uh, tried to talk about issues. We've, uh, we've reiterated the fact that talking, negotiations, table talk is the only way forward. The similar agreement, uh, says that uh, the, the Kashmir issue, the, the, no, the, the word issue or the word dispute is not used in, um, the, in the Simla agreement. And Kashmir is a dispute. It is, it is an issue. It is uh, the land of Jammu and Kashmir is disputed territory. The United Nations resolutions say that it is disputed territory. So we have to recognize that this is disputed land and we need to negotiate and there are this, these negotiations need to be tripartite. This is not a bilateral issue only between India and Pakistan. The Kashmiri people need to be present in those negotiations. They need to have a say in those negotiations and we would like also for a third party, a neutral third party to be present in those negotiations and uh, uh, mediate those negotiations. The United Nations must play its role in these negotiations. And so we would urge that the United States also must play a role, as it has done in history 
for human rights. The United States has always stood up for human rights, so we would urge it to do so again. I think we should open the door to the uh, open the floor to questions right now. Thank you very much for being so patient. Thank you both, and I think I must commend you both on sticking to your time. So uh, <laughs> this seldom happens here, but uh, thank you. Um, I want to start off <coughs> with you, uh, with Senator Mushahid. <coughs> I know you mentioned that Modi, Modi, Prime Minister Modi is ideologically driven, but I do want to refer back to his swearing-in ceremony, which was actually, in some sense, he invited all his neighbors, amongst which Prime, Ministers, Prime, Minister, Prime Minister Nawaz Sharif was also an important part of that swearing-in ceremony, and there was a strong desire to engage the neighborhood. And he, in his words, uh, if not a direct quote, India's destiny lies in its neighborhood. What do you think changed? And where do you think things went, things drifted apart? I think that was a, a general gesture to the members of SARC, not Pakistan specific, because he invited all the leaders of the SARC countries. And I think then domestic politics trumped the principle or the perspective of South Asian harmony. It's not just Pakistan. Nepal, which is a small country, sharing largely a culture and affinity and religious affinity with India also, the majority of Indians, that was subjected to a seven-month-long blockade under Mr. Modi's watch. And I think the campaign in Bihar, the campaign in Kashmir for the elections, probably required a degree of putting pressure on Pakistan. And we saw that reversal. So Mr. Modi has had his flips and flops. And I feel that the initial bonhomie could not be sustained when it came to the hard issues, the nitty gritty of Pakistan-India relations, which require negotiations, focusing, and starting with the issue of Kashmir. And unfortunately, that pattern was also seen uh, with other smaller South Asian countries like Nepal as well. I'll push you on the SARC issue. And you know, uh, except Nepal, you've had Sri Lanka, uh, Bhutan, um, Bangladesh, all jointly now withdrawing from the SARC summit itself. So also Maldives. Didn't also withdraw. Maldives, yeah. So where, what are these countries seeing, or what is? Have you have you had a chance to engage with them? What is their views and perceptions? I was reading an article in the Huffington Post on 28th of September, written by a gentleman called, who is their uh, contributing editor, Mr. Pramod Kumar, 28th of September. It's last week, yeah. Last week. And he said that the SARC hurts India more than Pakistan, this thing. He said it is no victory for India. And I quote Mr. <coughs> Pramod Kumar. I'm not. Uh, uh, he says that, according to him, and I quote, Afghanistan, Bangladesh, and Bhutan eat out of India's hands, unquote. So it is no great victory that if India tells them, they don't come and they denounce a boycott. And the issue is that it is cutting the nose to spite the face because Effectively, Mr. Modi is presiding over the slow motion demise of SARC. The institutional future of South Asia and Greater South Asia is unfortunately, thanks to Mr. Modi's intransigence, short-sightedness, obstinacy, and obduracy, it's no longer SARC, but it's the Shanghai Cooperation Organization. The focus will shift. Because if SARC is a non-starter, and this is the fifth time India has done it with SARC, postponing summits or canceling because of their own problems with bilateral countries. Remember, it was Sri Lanka also last time, other countries also. So I unfortunately, I feel that uh, uh, I agree with Mr. Pramod Kumar of the Huffington Post article of 28th of September. Okay. Um, there are some of the questions and issues that I want to touch on. And these are, you know, these are questions that come up, and these are, uh, these are mainly consensus 
of the so-called strategic uh, strategic community, the strategic affairs community. And I think, you uh, know, we have in, uh, what? in Washington, in, in Delhi, Washington. Oh, okay. you know, and, and some of my colleagues. And I think there's, this is not the first time that you might be posed these questions, sure. but I want to, for the sake of the record, I want to go, go at these questions. And you've consistently referred to the plebiscite issue. And your critics would allege about, and you also referred to the, some of the preconditions existing leading to that plebiscite issue. And your critics would allege that Pakistan is not being serious about implementing those preconditions. And if Pakistan is, you know, um, if the need for the resolution of the Kashmir dispute as per the UN Security Council resolutions uh, for holding plebiscite, namely the withdrawal of all its tribesmen and nationals who entered the region for the purpose of fighting. Could you comment on what Pakistan has taken in terms of steps about leading towards the implementation of this plebiscite? Uh, since uh, we have again and again come across deadlocks, the deadlock now needs to be, as I said, addressed through negotiation. Yes, there have been these problems. Pakistan has its own side uh, of the story. Pakistan uh, would present a different story and India would perhaps present a different story, but let's <coughs> not uh, get into that right now. Uh, that would be a very long debate. But right now, Pakistan urges that uh, India invoke the United Nations under Chapter 6 in <coughs> 1948, which is a peaceful resolution of a dispute. And so we would like from now on to again try to negotiate without any uh, preconditions in the sense that India says we only want to talk about terrorism in Pakistan. Pakistan says we are ready to talk about terrorism, we are ready to talk about all subjects, but Kashmir is a core issue for us and we need to talk about Kashmir as well. So we are not saying we don't want to talk about any subject at all, we are ready to talk about all subjects that India proposes. India says it only wants to talk about terrorism, so again there is a deadlock. And this is why we have asked for international intervention and, and uh, a, 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 a third party with, uh, with international authority to be able to intervene and mediate between India and Pakistan. I want to go back, go to this. I want to dig a little bit deeper into this subject, but before, since terrorism was mentioned, I want to go. Again, the cons consensus in the Beltway is in spite of international laws and sanctions. The militant group's leaders like Hafiz Saeed, um, who was a US designated terrorist, as well as Masood Azhar, the chief of um, an organization banned by Pakistan itself. How do you see them freely roaming in Pakistan? Pakistan uh, has carried out, like my uh, colleague said, one of the most successful, the longest and the largest war against terror. We have sacrificed out of all the countries in the world, we have sacrificed the most in this war on terror in terms of human resources, in terms of economic resources, and we continue to do that. Pakistan has been largely successful. We have cleared the area of Waziristan. We have cleared Karachi. Where we have cleared many of these uh, other areas. We have, uh, there have been drone strikes on Pakistan, the civilians have been killed, and yet Pakistan continues with its war on terror because we want, as much as anyone else, to eliminate terrorism from <coughs> the face of the earth. We, are, we have suffered more from terrorism than any other country. We had this uh, uh, attack on the army public school where our children were brutally massacred you, you remember the, the attack on Malala Yousafzai by terrorists, and she had to leave the country. Uh, so Pakistan is suffering and has suffered as much from terrorism as anyone else, and we, are, we have fought and we continue to fight the war on terror. But of course, like uh, my colleague said, America itself, the US itself failed in Afghanistan as well as Iraq. So this is not something that can happen within a few days. Correct. I, I just want to mention just sure. because you mentioned. Uh, just one aspect of U.S. designated terrorists. Uh, till recently, I think as of now, as we speak, I think Mr. Gulbadeen Hikmatyar is still designated as a terrorist by the United States of America. And he has recently signed a peace deal in Kabul where 8,500 U.S. troops are stationed. 
And I'm sure this designation will now be removed because he is now a good terrorist, according to the New Day. In the past, if you remember, in the case of Iran, there was MKO, Mujahideen e Khalq organization, which was designated by the United States as terrorist. But because after the capture of, uh, after the Iraq war, because they were needed, Iran became the axis of evil. So conveniently, the MKO, which was designated as a terrorist organization by the US under their law, was conveniently uh, protected. And even now, some of their people who have left Iraq have been sent by the US. So I think that uh, the US designations of, uh, of terrorists keep Fair changing enough. based on politics, not principles. Fair enough. But, you know, but the criticism has always been these groups which have harbored terrorism. The good, you know, yeah, Pakistan has gone after their terrorist and outfits. And you have your More than any other country. Uh, yes. And there are certain groups which are allowed to still freely operate which do not directly, the criticism has been, they do not affect Pakistan, but they target US troops and the Indian, certain Indian targets. How do you answer th to those criticisms? Pakistan actually does not believe in good and bad uh, terrorists. Pakistan, uh, as I said, we are ready to, uh, we are fighting this war on terror and we, are, we want to eliminate terrorism, not, from on, not only from our country, but from rest of the world, we are in the process. These, these wars and these eliminations cannot happen within a few days. I'll go back to your Kashmir. Does Pakistan recognize Jammu and Kashmir as a disputed territory? When we hold a free and a fair plebiscite, we are ready to hold it in all territories in f uh, where the negotiations lead us. You know where I'm going with that yes. is Azad Kashmir. Um, and the criticism has been, will all the political parties and subjects of the area be forced to support the state's accession? to Pakistan as a precondition to participate in local, um, local elections? Yes, we need to, first of all, start the negotiations. Before that, this, this, uh, dr the uh, draconian laws that are right now prevailing in Kashmir, for example, the, the uh, Armed Forces uh, Special, Power Special Powers Act. Act. And then there is uh, Public, Safety Act. Public Safety Act, under which uh, uh, a human rights activist, Kuram Parvez, is even now in detention for unlimited time in the in the, in the uh, Jammu jail, which is a, a notorious jail, and the Kashmiri people are fearing for his life. Uh, there are other Hurriyat leaders. Hurriyat means freedom. There are other leaders the, who were asking <coughs> for freedom, who've been uh, under detention for for many many years now, and uh, no one has any answer for them. So. What the, the questions that you are asking will be put on the negotiating table, but first, this uh, violation of the human rights needs to stop. Then India has to agree to uh, negotiations, and then we are open to all these questions. We, I mean, can, we don't have answers for these questions now. I mean, you know, the, because some of the what I see is complications after complications, right? If you acknowledge uh, if JNK is a disputed territory, then China building allow being allowed to con construct roads as part of CPEC is now. China constructed that road in 1966, and, and it was uh, there. We constructed a dam called Mangla Dam in that mm -hmm. area under the World Bank. Uh, with uh, there was no hear and cry from India. So it's nothing new. Development projects which benefit the people of the region, whether it is in Azad Kashmir or Gilgit Baltistan or Indian occupied Kashmir is something that is normal. It's been gone going. And it, of late there has been an expression of concern and the China has become a bee in India's bonnet because of other reasons. It seems strategic reasons because China uh, is seen in, by some people in the beltway mm -hmm. where you are located as a sort of a quote-unquote threat, and there's need to contain China, and India is now willing and ready and able to offer itself uh, in this so-called containment of China thing, which is unfortunate because we don't want a new Cold War in the area. I mean, Because that would provoke a new Cold War, and already we have seen a reaction from the Russian side to this whole thing. India had long derided Pakistan for offering bases to the Americans, and now they're doing the same. <laughs> what an irony of history. Uh, you know, I'm, I mean, in a 
looking at taking a step back, and I see this in a broader, uh, broader framework, today I think countries in the Asia Pacific are aligning themselves economically to China. They want the United States to be sensitive to their own economic interests with China, but on security realms, I see them aligning with, uh, with the United States. Not the Philippines any longer. Not the Philippines, correct. But you know, Pakistan, in some sense, has hedged its bets economically and security on China, in security terms with China. Would you agree with that? We have had a long-standing relationship with China since 1963, a strategic relationship. It started when Mr. Nehru, the apostle of non-alignment, did a massive U-turn ideologically, historically, in foreign policy, and asked, in fact, begged the Americans to give him arms against the Chinese, something he had long derided Pakistan for. And the Americans obliged. And we were the allies of America. We had given them Bada Bear base. When we closed that base in 68, Mrs. Gandhi offered the CIA communications base in northern India to monitor Tibet. And we were there. So it, it, it was in that context, if you see the historical context. So I think when we talk of history, facts which are sacred should be there. Opinions are secondary. We can all hold different opinions. And we are entitled to our opinions. And we respect people's opinions. <coughs> but I think facts are facts. So I think there is a certain track record which is there. Uh, India is going through that process. Good luck to it. But we do not want it to spark another Cold War. And you know. Mr. Obama had built up the Trans-Pacific Partnership as a major economic counterweight to China. China was excluded from that. And today, both the candidates, Hillary Clinton and Donald Trump, have said we uh, don't need that TPP. Um, as you can see, there's a lot of curiosity here. And I do not know where to start from. But there, why not? Yeah. I'll come to you. Please introduce yourself. Yes, I am Ahmar Masti Khan, and uh, I am a freelance journalist. I am an American, uh, originally from Pakistan, occupied Baluchistan. Which uh, journalist, uh, uh, new outlet you write for? Uh, I, I write for, for uh, Yahud or Hunud publications. One is called Israel's Voice, other is called The News Minute, and quite a few others. I would please <coughs> like to ask you, you have talking about human rights. In Baluchistan, sir, my friend, Wahid Baluch, a scholar and an academic, disappeared July 17. No one knows where he has gone, by the ISI. My cousin, last year, he just tweeted on Twitter, was disappeared for four days, four nights. My sister was running from pillar to post. Finally, he came back. 6,000 people, Baluch, killed and dumped. Officially, Pakistan acknowledged 1,000, right? Thousands are still victims of enforced disappearances. You guys came and tested nuclear weapons in Baluchistan. Can there be a graver injustice? Kashmir thing pales to what you are doing in Baluchistan. Your army and ISI is a problem. Please acknowledge that. Thank you, Mr. Amar Mastekhan. Uh, you'll be pleased to know that I am a regular reader of the Yahud and Hanud publications, starting with Haaretz. <laughs> I lead, read Haaretz every day. <laughs> I read the Jerusalem Post every day. So you're not committed to any kufr by being working for Hanud and Yunahud. I Because when we learn, we have to have an open mind. We have to learn from there. I was the first person in Pakistan to prepare a report on Balochistan, on every aspect of Balochistan, including human rights, including development. And that report has been accepted all across the political spectrum. It was the Parliamentary Committee on Balochistan. And I visited every nook and corner. And we have ourselves, whenever there are excesses or violations of human rights in any parts of Pakistan, those have been talked of, those have been focused on. If there are new issues, please let us know. But uh, I would like to clear that legally and constitutionally, uh, I think the formulation should be very clear. Uh, your initial formulation of uh, Pakistan <laughs> occupied Balochistan, it's like saying Indian occupied Khalistan. I wouldn't look, like to use that term, because then you can talk of Indian occupied Nagaland, or uh, so-and-so occupied Kurdistan. 
I think there are, under international law, Palestine and Kashmir are disputed territory. There are other territories which are an integral part of a nation state. And yes, whenever there are uh, 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 revelations or violations of human rights, they are publicly condemned in Pakistan. You knew the program of uh, GEO and Hamad Mir. It mentioned that. Other areas mentioned that. There are aberrations in every society. In the United States of America, where I lived in this great town, by the way, I'm a Washingtonian of sorts because I was studying in Georgetown University. Ah, okay. And I neighbor. lived here. Yes. Yeah. 33rd and P Street, which I call Pakistan Street. Yeah. In this country today, every third day, a black guy is killed by a white cop. There's a fault line on racial issues. There are fault lines in Indian society. There are fault lines in Pakistan society. We all try to clear that. We try to reverse the wrongs. And when the wrongs are there, and we speak up on that. And uh, I was the editor of the Muslim newspaper, The Muslim, in the days of General Ziaul Haq. And we were the first to speak against strategic depth. It was unthinkable those days. Khwaja Saab and I got thrown out from the university because of the so-called left and right business. So there are voices that speak up and that they condemn that, and that should be condemned with all the force, the command, based on facts, logic, and everything. And Mr. Amar Mastekh Khan, certainly I'll give you my card after this meeting, and I look forward to continue our communication. Thank you, sir, for your insights. So the gentleman there, and then I'll come to you. I'll come to you. Mr. Mushayar Sen, I'm uh, uh, Sufi Lagari. I'm a Sindhi, and I met you a couple of times yes. when uh, you were very much engaged with the Baluchistan. You went to meet uh, Nawab Akbar Khan Bukti. And you know more about what happened with him and uh, all those issues you were dealing. And Madam is saying that the right to self-determination to Kashmir, if the Baluchistan is asking right to self-determination of Baluchistan, what will be your reaction? And uh, also, the Sindhi people, you said the human rights. Myself, sir, brother, he was a doctor, medical doctor. He was serving the people. He was human rights helping to the academic side, health side. You know what happened to him? This is the ninth month, the corrupt government of PPP and the corrupt government of the Nawaz Sharif. They haven't done anything. And you know what? ISI is continuous, continuously. What they are doing, harassing to my nephew. And my nephew got the first position in whole Pakistan. And he is studying now in where? In Salt Lake City, Utah University. He was telling to me that ISI people come to our home and harassing. Uncle, I cannot tell you on the phone. This is personally I'm telling you, sir. What happened to the Sindhi other people? Muzaffar Bhutto was killed. Human rights violation in our own, own country. Sir, I'm telling you, we only talk about the problem. We don't talk about the solution. If we talk about the solution, I'm telling you, if, if the Hafiz Said, he's openly in Thar, in other places, open the charity organization, who's protecting, who's giving them money? ISI. If the person who comes with the guns, what will be the future of Pakistan? The Kashmir, okay. you're talking about, or Balochistan? I'm telling you, I want to be the part of the solution, not part of the problem. And please, ask your ambassador, how many times the congressman, Brett Sherman, asked him about the human rights violation in Sindh province? Did they reply to anything? Nothing. Uh, thank you very much, Sufi Saab. It's good to see you in Washington. And if you remember that uh, when I was a newspaper editor in the days of General Ziaul Haq's military dictatorship, I was the first journalist who left Islamabad during the MRD agitation of August 1983. I traveled all across Sindh, starting with son, GM Sigit Saab. I did his interview. I went to Nawaz Jatoi. I went to uh, uh, Larkana, Ratodero. I went to see Abdul Hamid Jatoi Saab. I went to see Sayyid Alam Shah Saab from the uh, Sulbaksh Religious Party, who was then under arrest, Awami Tariq. 
and the first articulation of Sindhi grievances in the national press was courtesy my Sindh diaries, which I did on my own. And that was, I am not, I am from Islamabad, I represent Islamabad in the capital, I am not from the Sindh province. But the issue is not of Sindh or Balochistan or Khyber Pakhtunkhwa or Punjab, it is about the people and it's about principles. Whenever there are wrongs, they need to be redressed. And I totally agree with you, it should be part of the solution. And people should speak up on that, as we did in those days of, there's a General Zia's dictatorship I'm talking of, and that's part of the record. So I think that if there are issues, I would like to uh, talk to you, sir, after this meeting. Thank you, sir, yes. for coming, and I appreciate that. Your name is, of course, symptomatic of the culture of Sindh, which is a land of Sufis, saints, and scholars. Can I just add that, add to that, that this uh, debate definitely is legitimate, but right now uh, uh, I would like to uh, stress that the uh, territorial integrity and the sovereignty of Pakistan under international laws uh, must be observed and therefore uh, whatever is happening within Pakistan <coughs> cannot be equated with what is happening in Kashmir because Kashmir is a disputed territory. Again, as my colleague said, there are human rights violations <coughs> happening in all countries, including India. Uh, there's the issue of Khalistan, but that is not something that uh, debate is not for the present, but it's a legitimate debate that can happen at another time. I have a lot of questions uh, going up. I'll start. That gentleman has been there for a while. Uh, Good morning, sir. Good morning, ma'am. My name is uh, Nisim Rupin. I'm uh, Nisim Rupin. I'm the assistant director for Asia at the American Jewish Committee. And uh, my uh, dad's cousins lived in Pakistan, in Karachi. There was a Jewish community in uh, Karachi and very proud memories of olden days, including two synagogues. Sir, I had a question. We spoke about the Nixonian moment. And I very well remember that uh, while taking off from Kabul, even the MEA was not aware and Prime Minister Modi told the pilot, we are landing in Lahore. So that was, was that a Nixonian moment? at that time where he sort of, the MEA was not in sync with what he was doing and he took a decision on his own and uh, and the other... Uh, the MEA is not in sync most of the time. <laughs> <laughs> well, but uh, that was, I think that's one question where would... And the other thing, we, Dr. Manmohan Singh wanted to go to Pakistan. He was born there and he wanted to go and, but he couldn't muster the courage. Would a right, center, right of center government in India have the leeway to reach out to Pakistan like the other governments could not. And one other point I had to make about the religious uh, bent of the government. You know, when this government was elected, there was a lot of expectation in Washington and in, in Israel that the Prime Minister Modi is coming to Israel. And it's been two years since they announced that he's going to Israel. And we had, and being from South Asia, I had said that Mr. Modi has to first land in Riyadh and Tehran, and then my, maybe he will come to Tel Aviv. And that prophecy has come true. So I just wanted to some comments. Thank you, Mr. Rubin. And um, <coughs> I would like to say that uh, I appreciate uh, uh, the role of the American Jewish community. Thank you for your thing. I was studying in Georgetown. Uh, it's not metaphorical that my best friends have been Jews. <laughs> Whether it, 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 yes, yes. And uh, uh, in fact, I had difficulties in my initial courses. Uh, I was, uh, I'd come after doing my bachelor's from Pakistan. And uh, I had difficulty in statistics because look at them, Muslims are bad in maths, Hindus are very good in maths. I say, Saab Kitab. So, and I was helped by people like Jim Khan, Jim Khan, Steve Rosen, and others. And uh, uh, I've danced on the Hava Nagila, and I've celebrated the uh, Jewish uh, days. And we uh, we eat things which are kosher. And of course, uh, Jews have made a major contribution in uh, South Asia also. I remember reading the book of uh, General J.F.R. Jacob, who was one of the very respected military commanders also. And I cannot forget when I went to Bosnia in 1993 to express solidarity with uh, President Ali Ezad Begovic. And he said, he was a Muslim, Ali Ezad Begovic. We owe a lot to the Jewish community of the United States of America for their support to the oppressed Muslims of Bosnia Herzegovina against the ethnic cleansing by the extremists. And the single largest donation made by any 
uh, person for the Boston Muslims was George Soros. $50 million. One single donation. Bigger than any other Muslim donation. And if you see the list, uh, movie Schindler's List, which talks of the Holocaust, I've seen that movie. It's a very moving movie. Because we also have always condemned the Holocaust. The crimes against humanity committed by the Christians of Europe against the Jews of Europe, not Muslims. And it's in the Anglo-Saxon culture, maybe it's there. When we talk, I read English literature, I read Charles Dickens, it's Fagin the Jew. I read William Shakespeare, it's Shylock the Jew. So the demonization took place somewhere else, not in the Islamic cultures, where the Jews were partners of the Muslims in power in Granada and Cordoba. Coming to the Nixonian moment, your very important question. Uh, sir, that was a social gesture. It was to wish happy birthday to a neighboring leader on that day. Nixonian gesture would be that you take, you have the moral courage, you have the vision, you have the will to take concrete steps. And I still have hopes. Because Mr. Modi is not from the Delhi establishment. He is an outsider. So he's unpredictable. The Delhi establishment is capturing him slowly but surely. Because it's a very powerful establishment in India also. And I remember, you talked about uh, Manmohan Singh. I remember, I was in the talks with Mr. Manmohan Singh in 2005. He was flanked by two <coughs> pillars of the Indian establishment who never had a smile. They were always sulking. <coughs> One was Natwar Singh, the foreign minister. One was Kiar Narayan, his, dip, his national security. And you could see from the faces they were hardened hawks. And I could almost feel they were holding him by the sleeve, you know, because he wanted to have the outreach, but you know they were held by the sleeve. And a good man, a decent man. His village is a Ga in Chakwal, 60 miles from Islamabad. We had invited him. And that opportunity was there. Whatever you might say, it's the past, Mr. Musharraf. But he did throw things on the table. He said, let's talk. Let's take the initiative. Let's have an out-of-the-box solution. Even that was not grasped. And you remember, we had almost reached agreement on Siachin. But it was scuttled, not by the politicos in Delhi, by the military establishment of India the second time around. 89 also, Rajiv Gandhi and Benazir Bhutto had reached the agreement in their meeting in July 1989 in Islamabad. But when Rajiv went back, the people in Khaki in New Delhi said, it's no go. So I think that that is why we say that politicians have to be statesmen. These are very major issues. You just had the death of Shimon Peres. You had F.W.D. Clark in South Africa. He presided over the dismantling of apartheid, which is impossible, unthinkable, that there would be a peaceful transition. They thought there'll be a bloodbath between the races. It was averted. So South Asia is heir to a very rich civilization and culture. We have a common heritage. And I think that uh, uh, I always felt that the Jews are smarter than the rest of them. <laughs> they work very hard. They're hardworking. They work ethic. So there should be that tradition. And I think uh, you should use that thing. And uh, Advani Saab went to Israel. But Mr. Modi, I think, uh, uh, has to wait for pragmatic or political reasons. And if when those considerations come in, then other principles take a back seat. And we hope that uh, in the case of uh, Pakistan-India relations and the case of Kashmir, Mr. Modi will rise to the occasion. Because he's a self-made man. He's not there because of a rich daddy or a rich granddaddy or a famous surname. He's there. He's worked his way up. OK, we have problems with some of its political genealogy, which affects his <laughs> worldview. But if he can really rise to the occasion, we'll see a different future for South Asia, a better future. 
I have this gentleman waiting here for long. Uh, maybe I'll just couple a cup. I'll club the questions and then we'll. Uh, <coughs> uh, Dr. Asim Yousafzai, I'm a geoscientist by training, but I venture into geopolitics as well. I work at University of Maryland. Um, the uh, title of the uh, talk was Kashmir, and it was a little bit um, misleading because, uh, Senator, most, you spend most of your time um, criticizing the U.S. and India. Um, you also termed uh, Operation Zerbia Zab in FATA as more successful than the U.S. ops in Afghanistan. Um, I will ask a question uh, on that. Uh, the operation is now in its uh, third year. Um, a lot of gains uh, are reported by the Pakistan Army. Um, why is it that not a single high-value target has been killed in that operation in which about 3,500 terrorists have been killed, which are reported to be killed, claimed to be killed in FATA? Uh, there are hundreds of thousands of internally displaced people who cannot go back. Uh, they have st very slowly started to go back, but there are still a lot of them. All the high-value targets, about two dozens of them, have either been killed by the U.S. drones or by the U.S. special ops. For example, the one in, uh, in Abbottabad, which took out Osama bin Laden. So why do you think that is? Why no high-value targets have been taken out by the Pakistani forces? I'll take this <coughs> question. Uh, uh, I would ask my question yeah. along with this. Uh, my name is Utsav, and I'm with the World Hindu Council. Uh, World? Bu World Hindu Council. World Hindu Council. Buran Wani, uh, somebody you both mentioned a lot and extolled him, called himself the commander of Hezbollah Mujahideen, which is a banned organization by the US. And he murdered many people, made videos calling for creating an Islamic caliphate, not very different from what al-Baghdadi from ISIS does. And yet, how do you explain you both and Prime Minister Nawaz Sharif extolling him as a hero from the auspices of the United Nations? I'll, I'll take yeah, this. Thank you so much. Uh, Honorable Senator, good to see you again. My name is Singet Sering. I'm from uh, Gilgit, Baltistan. Uh, you talked about U.S. failures in Afghanistan and repeatedly said that uh, Pakistan has done much better than the U.S. Maybe one of the reasons is that Pakistan has been helping the Taliban, which is killing U.S. soldiers. Uh, so next time, since you're on the Defense Committee, maybe you want to sit in front of those mothers and wives who have lost their sons and husbands and explain to them why you take money from U.S. and then give it to Taliban to kill the U.S. soldiers. Now coming to uh, Kashmir, since I'm from Gilgit, Baltistan, I see both of you as a proxy of Pakistani military, not representing Kashmir. Pakistan has proxies in Indian Kashmir. They have weapons and explosives. You come here as a proxy with sweet talk. Every time when the money dries up, you show up here with blackmail, Russia talk, China talk, Iran, I request U.S. to get out of this vicious cycle. Pakistan is no, not good for any country, and it has not done any good for the United States, and it, it is not good for the people of Kashmir. You occupy one-third of Kashmir, and occupier cannot be a friend of Kashmir on the other side. You have been exploiting resources in Gilgit, Baltistan, last point, without paying royalty or compensation a single penny for the last 70 years. I call you a thief in Gilgit, Baltistan, and a thief in Gilgit, Baltistan cannot be a friend in Jammu and Kashmir, a thief in Azad Kashmir without paying royalty for Mangla Dam that you mentioned, and having free electricity, you cannot be a friend in Kashmir. The only thing that is good is that Pakistani army wants to maintain a status quo because that is a money-making machine, and that is what Kashmir is. You and Resolution want you to withdraw. That is the first prerequisite. I want everyone here to go on internet. It's a one-page document, only one-page document. The first prerequisite is you get out of Gilgit, Baltistan, and Azad Kashmir, and then the people of Kashmir, the United Nations, and Indian government will sit down to form a mechanism to hold the plebiscite. And this double talk that you have been doing in Afghanistan and in Kashmir and in US, it needs to be exposed. 
And I will tell you, everywhere you go, there will be someone from Gilgit Baltistan exposing Pakistan. Thank you. you I think I'll take that. Yeah. Uh, First question. of all, thank you, Mr. Uh, Yusuf Zaysab. 60,000 Pakistanis, mothers, sisters, daughters, are testimony to the war that we have successfully waged. It's Pakistanis, army public school people, the students who were killed. It is testimony to that. So we should be very clear on the basics. And a lot of the top leadership has already been eliminated in Pakistan. And if the drones were being done on those days, you should know that there was a lot of joint counter-terror cooperation, which has been appreciated by the US <coughs> civil and military leadership very clearly. So, and if some of them have managed to escape across the poorest border between Pakistan and Afghanistan, 2,600 kilometers, uh, 2,600 kilometers, ridges, mountains, rivers, and they are there. I'm talking about Fazlullah. So, and I hope and look forward that those targets, which are within sights of the United States, they would also be targeted because they are killing people in Pakistan. So we have had more success, and I repeat what I said earlier, than any other country. And we have paid the highest price for that also, the maximum sacrifices. And we are continuing to do that. It's not just the fight of the army, it's the national fight where the parliament where the government, federal and provincial, are fully on board. The success ratio will be more if we have more cooperation from our neighborhood and our friends. But the people are very clear that this is an existential threat, and we have to eliminate that. And we have shown that will. And we also established the national action plan for that. Coming to your question, sir, one part will be answered. Well, there are some people in the Indian uh, Polity, which extol Nathuram Gatse, the killer of Mahatma Gandhi, a murderer, as a hero. Maybe you know some of them also. So They're not. Nobody, nobody calls. No, I'm. Makes I, them a hero from United no, no, States. please. No. Uh, uh, you've asked a question. I did not interrupt. Please, you are entitled to your question, uh, and I listened very patiently to because that is a civilized way of focusing. We are having a discussion. People are entitled to their views. I said from day one. And I've been a journalist also. I've been a professor of politics also. So uh, we uh, questions asked, whether factual or not factual, I don't go into the merits. I don't pass value judgments. But I feel that everybody is entitled to their opinions, and they have the right to ask a question, and people have the right to respond accordingly. So uh, the uh, same premise should be used that when extremism has no religion, Terrorism has no religion. I was uh, in a BBC program soon after the nuclear tests <coughs> in 1998 with a retired Indian general. And he said to me, oh, you Pakistanis, you have the Islamic bomb. I said, general, I never realized that bombs also have religions. He said, I said then, by that reckoning, should I say that India has the vegetarian bomb? So you know, I think instead of labels, instead of allegations, instead of having that harangue, we should have a more mature, civilized discourse. And to the question about what Pakistan has done no good to the United States, I think that uh, when we opened the doors of Beijing to the United States of America in 1971, we did a big favor to world peace. It was the biggest geopolitical transformation of that time after World War II. It was Pakistan which did it. And we paid a heavy price, because then the Indo-Soviet axis was there. We did it. And I say that we did that favor. Then, when the Soviet Union came into Afghanistan, Nobody was talking. 
People were wringing their hands. The US was under Carter. They had given up on the region. We gave succor. We gave refuge. We gave sanctuary to three million oppressed Afghans who were fleeing their motherland because the country was under occupation. We didn't get a penny. We didn't get a cent from the Americans then. Reagan came in 1981. I'm talking of December 1979. We stood up to that because we morally feel as Pakistanis that yes, it's a neighbor in trouble. We have to help that. And then there was a joint thing. And that war transformed the geopolitics in the 21st century, in the 20th century. The collapse of communism in Eastern Europe, the collapse of the Soviet Union, the dismantling of the Soviet Union, which led to 17 different states, the demolition of the Berlin Wall. I think I'm glad that Hillary Clinton had the moral courage to give the credit where it's due to Pakistan when he said Pakistan did that favor to us at great sacrifices. We have st stood up for that. In the 1950s, in the 1950s, when there was the war of liberation among states which are there in uh, uh, the Maghreb, Tunisia, Morocco, Algeria, it was Pakistani passports they traveled on. Nobody was speaking up for them. So we have taken a position. Bosnian refugees, we gave them re refuge in Pakistan. We had no interest there. So we take positions which are moral. Sri Lanka's fight against terrorism, Pakistan played a pivotal role in that. So I think we have a track record. Yes, like any other state, we have made mistakes. There are fault lines, there are problems. They need to be resolved in accordance with law, in accordance with principles. You want to respond and, uh, briefly? I would just like to say about Burhan Wani that, yes, uh, yes uh, Pakistan uh, persists in its claim that Burhan Wani was a freedom fighter who was, uh, uh, who was uh, raising the voice uh, the call for freedom for his people. He was a young 22-year-old uh, boy. Uh, yet, even for a moment, if you <coughs> want to, uh, to go back from that perspective, uh, there was, India had no legal uh, uh, standing to cold-bloodedly murder Burhan Wani. He could have gone under trial. Then he could have, then these uh, 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 things that you're saying, if they were proven in a court of law and Burhan Wani was punished, then that's the legal way to do it. And uh, so he was, uh, th this was extrajudicial murder of Burhan Wani. So and uh, just to also say, uh, to respond to the gentleman, uh, yes, I would also urge the audience to go to the internet to look up the, uh, the, the resolutions passed by. They call for a free and fair plebiscite. Uh, Liaquat Ali Khan uh, agreed to uh, remove the troops, it was India at that time also who refused to do to, to remove their troops, which th the both of them were required to move their troops from Kashmir. Uh, uh, please read read up on that also, and th this is what happened. Uh, now, again, a free and fair plebiscite is not only a, a democratic necessity; it is a moral imperative to allow the people of Kashmir to have a say in what. They want for themselves. Do I have a right to reply to the lady's line here? Not at the moment, please. No, I'm, no, no, no. Everybody no. would think that she's telling the truth. No, no, I think we should not have it. I want the, the Indians to, to stay there to maintain law and order. I, I have read, I have read the resolutions. Want Pakistani troops to withdraw, and she's lying. I think this is for the, no. the moderator. Yeah. So you know, moderate the event. I. So. Seventy years of disinformation. The gentleman there, and. Um, uh, here is a plan. So keep your questions very brief, please. And I have four people here. One, <coughs> two, three, four, and then I'll come to you, and you'll be part of the final round. So. Mushayat Saab, this is Jalil Afridi from the Frontier Post. Um, uh, I have two questions. Um, one is, do you feel that uh, there has been a policy <coughs> change in the U.S. 
since last one year with regard to the region and uh, especially with regard to India, uh, they have become much more closer than they used to be. Uh, especially when you look at Modi, he was not uh, given a US visa for the last 20 years for killing more than I think 250 people? 1,000. 1,000 people. And neither did the U uh, UK government uh, give him a visa. <coughs> now he's one of the favorite guys of uh, uh, this US government. So do you feel like there has been a change in the US policies towards India? And is that one of the reasons why Pakistan has shifted uh, their friendship towards China more? Uh, this is one of my questions. My second question is, do you feel a little bit of slackness uh, from the side of Pakistan for not highlighting uh, some of the uh, things which Pakistan was facing for the last 15 years? Uh, with regard to terrorism, uh, do you feel like uh, Pakistan has done a little bit of a poor job in not highlighting some of the problems it was facing, you know, uh, especially in Balochistan, especially in Fatah, the challenges, the financial uh, restraints, uh, even uh, the recent incident in Balochistan of an uh, Indian naval officer being arrested there, do you not think that Pakistan should have highlighted these things on a much uh, stronger and on a higher level, the things which are doing right now here, sitting okay. at Atlantic so Council? I Don't you think these things should have been done a, a, a bit like sooner? Thank you. Thank you. The, um, one, two, and three. Uh, Senator, you mentioned earlier that uh, for the first time, Pakistan and Russia are engaging in military exercises together. And I wonder if you could explain a little bit the impetus um, for the decision to engage in those exercises and then how that relationship has changed in the past few years. Uh, and I wonder if both of you could comment. I think that's been covered a little bit. So um, the gentleman next <coughs> to you and then. Hello, um, my name's Ethan Trucker. I'm from the Cindy American Political Action Committee. Um, I just find it um, unbelievable that Pakistan would highlight um, allege of Indian human rights violations in Kashmir when in 2013 um, a local uh, Kashmir leader Arif Shaheed was assassinated by the ISI and I was just, just like to point out that there are plenty of extrajudicial killings in Pakistan especially in Balochistan, um, Assad Kashmir and uh, Sindh. So how do you respond to that when you accuse of India of these violations when Pakistan is known for these? The gentleman, the press trust of India. Uh, thank you, Senator, for giving your perspective on what's Pakistan's reason for the region and its peace. Uh, I have a two follow-up questions, one from the gentleman from Maryland University about the high-value target. Uh, in July, Donald Trump uh, tweeted that where is Pakistan going to apologize for giving shelter to Osama bin Laden for six years, uh, and he described Pakistan as an ally for the United States. What's your response to that? And uh, and secondly, how do you how do you view what's your how do you describe Hafiz Saeed uh, in Pakistan? And then I'll come to the, this side of the table after the final round of questions, if you want to respond. Uh, yes, uh, uh, the two questions from Mr. Afridi. Yes, we see a certain policy shift from the United States. Because in 2006, as you rightly pointed out, the US Committee on International Religious Freedom, which is enjoined by the US Congress to give a certificate on international religious freedom all over the world. On their recommendation, the State Department denied the Chief Minister of Gujarat a visa to the United States. And it was followed suit by the British government. We have no problem with the US doing a U-turn to meet its own strategic interests or political interests. Because Mr. Modi is now the prime minister. But this U-turn uh, started in the time of 2006 under Bush also, when they had the US-India civil nuclear deal which was a violation of US laws, the Symington Amendment, and the violation of the NPT, the Non-Proliferation Treaty. 
because India is a declared nuclear weapons power. So in that context, we feel that the US is losing sight, looking at the trees, but not at the forest. It's losing sight of the other interests. The most important interest of the US is stability of Afghanistan and counterterrorism. And that should have been, for that, willy-nilly, whether they like it or not, they need Pakistan's cooperation, which they have been getting, and we have been providing, and we have been also suffering in the process. So we see that shift, and that shift, I think, uh, uh, would uh, be detrimental to the Americans' own security interests in South Asia. Coming to the second question of yours, yes, we, there, I think there has been some slackness in presenting the Pakistan narrative. I'll take two, two examples. SWAT operation, let's start with that, 2009. At that time, a statement was made. The Taliban are 60 miles from Islamabad. This is on the record that they will, it's, Islamabad is under threat. There was a big operation. 80% of the population of SWAT left SWAT. They were, re they were guests of their own friends and relatives without UNHCR. And after six months, that population went back. It's a unique thing. The area was cleaned off, as my colleague mentioned about Malala Yousafzai in that context. It was done by Pakistan itself. Secondly, in uh, Fatah, there was big talk of the ROZs, Reconstruction Opportunity Zones. That was the highlight, that there will be Reconstruction Opportunity Zones provided. They will produce duty-free goods, which will then lead to a manufacturing industrial development in Fatah. Unfortunately, that went fizzled out. I remember talking to at that time, Senator John Kerry, Chairman Foreign Relations Committee, and I said, what about the ROZs? That was the centerpiece of your policy. He said, no, 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 we'll give you guys now FTA, Free Trade Agreement. I said, that's up in the air, and that never happened. And also on Yadav, he was caught red-handed on 3rd March 2016, and as a confessed spy for Indian intelligence. And I think by now, we should have had his dossier circulated all over. So yes, your point is well taken. The lady has asked about uh, Pakistan-Russia relations. I think it's important to understand that every action has a reaction. Mr. Modi's love affair with America, or a new romance, shall we say, it's a new, it certain has blossomed of late uh, when they became, and Mr. Cl uh, Obama went twice there and so forth. That has rung alarm bells in Moscow. And Mr. Putin is a very strong leader. He is not like Yeltsin. He's not like Gorbachev. He sees that a new Cold War is being sparked close to his doorstep. Georgia, Ukraine, NATO expansion, so forth. So he is focusing on the region, and he's having an outreach not just with Pakistan, with Iran, with Turkey, with Egypt, even Saudi Arabia. So he feels that if Modi can uh, play a footsie with the Americans, why can't I play a footsie with Modi's uh, perceived adversaries? Two can tango, two can play the game. So that is the, and it's a very significant outreach, two visits by the Russian defense minister to Pakistan, one visit by the Pakistan defense minister and the army chief to Moscow, each separately. So this is something, and remember, China and Russia are also very close in the region. So this, I think, we are looking at a new kind of alignment. And it's also a function of Modi's, uh, of Russia, Putin's relationship with Washington. So if you see cumulatively, Pakistan, of course, sir, we have no conflict of interest with Russia. We welcome Russian uh, involvement. Uh, after all, we had uh, seen the reverse side, and we now see that perhaps they are also being engaged in Afghanistan now. China is already engaged in Afghanistan. And uh, according to our reports, uh, the, uh, the Russians are also having some discrete back channel with the Afghan Taliban as well. So I think our situation is uh, certainly changing. And uh, regarding our friend from PTI, I look forward to, sir, you have asked for an interview with us, and I will certainly like to give you the interview because I, uh, you are a respected journalist from the Press Trust of India, and 
Uh, I've had good relations with India. I was the first Pakistani journalist to write a syndicated column in the Indian media, 89 onwards, in the Times of India and the Hindustan Times and the Telegraph. And my newspaper, The Muslim, when I was the editor, was the first Pakistani newspapers which uh, uh, let Indian journalists write for the Pakistani press. Uh, Bhavani San Gupta, Pran Chopra, Kuldeep Nair Saab. And I was the first to organize the track two, first track two between India and Pakistan ever in 1984 in Islamabad. So we have, uh, and because neighbors, you cannot wish away. Uh, you see, the Chinese saying is a close neighbor is better than a distant relative. So I think you are a close neighbor. We want to have good neighborly relations, and I think it's important. You talked about Trump saying that. I think let Hillary Clinton respond to Trump on the debate on 9th, and I look forward to her response, because she's better at responding to Trump than I. I don't want to interfere in American internal politics. And uh, uh, to respond to uh, this gentleman yeah. who, who talked about, uh, <coughs> you see, you, you, you've said that Pakistan is accusing India, but Pakistan is asking, prime, the Prime Minister has asked for a fact-finding mission to be sent to Kashmir, uh, an independent observer group to be sent to Kashmir. There is the United uh, Nations Military Observer Group on India and Pakistan. We want that to be sent to both mm -hmm. sides to be activated of Kashmir. Bilkul. We want that to come. We want an independent observer group to come. And we want them to observe and then make their own findings and then uh, go on from the, those findings. Okay. Please raise. Um, I have two questions and f three questions, five minutes. So if you could, yeah, this gentleman first. Hello. Keep your, uh, if you could keep your questions brief, I'd really uh, appreciate it. I have actually two questions, one for sir and one for ma'am. Uh, I'll, 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 make it it. I'll make it quick. I'll make it quick. Uh, I'm a Kashmiri, a native Kashmiri, but a Hindu. Uh, my ancestors have been living in Kashmir for the past more than 5,000 years, uh, way before the existence of even Islam. Uh, I would like to know, uh, I mean, Pakistan's support uh, for the Islamic terrorists in Kashmir uh, how is that different from its support from the terrorists uh, of Haqqani Network, Al-Qaeda, or Taliban? How do you say that they're different from that? Okay. And second question to ma'am. Uh, I would like to agree with the, my friend from the other side uh, about the resolution number 47, that Pakistan has been spreading misinformation about it. The resolution number 47 clearly okay. states that Pakistan That's has fine. to remove its, the points all made. its forces. Th so thank you. I would like to agree with him. Yeah, and the gentleman. Uh, uh, and again, I have, half a minute for you. I have question. two questions as well. Uh, first, uh, after the Ori attack, uh, the relationship between India and Pakistan are quite tense, and the relationship is based on distrust. So there are voices raising after that that the Indus water treaty will be revoked. So what's the stance of the Pakistani government, and what steps are they taking to tackle this situation? Number two, there was a statement on 23rd September 2016 by the Nawab of uh, Junagar, uh, uh, Jangir Kanji, he's say, stating that the the instrument of succession is still intact. So is Pakistan planning to take that in the international level as well? Thank you very much. And the lady out there, please don't ask two questions. No, no. I'm sorry. I only have yeah. one question. Yeah. Uh, so I just wanted to ask that uh, we, we thought that we need to sit and negotiate with India. What strategic planning or what leverage do we have against India that can cons uh, convince India to come and sit on the table. Disincentive to war might not be enough for India. What other plan do we have? And you have four minutes for three questions and two people. <laughs> <laughs> uh, <clears throat> I think that uh, sometimes one person's view of terrorism is, can be different than the other person's view of terrorism. When Mrs. Gandhi decided to support the liberation tigers of Tamil Elam in 1983 in Sri Lanka, they were certified as terrorists by the international community, but India thought otherwise. But after the killing of Rajiv Gandhi by the same terrorists, India changed its views. So I hope that uh, India realizes that uh, there's a popular, spontaneous, widespread and indigenous uprising. And as Rajmohan Gandhi has said, a de facto plebiscite is already taking place. Regarding the Uri attack, my uh, distinguished colleague, Senator, Ali has mentioned UNMOGIP, United Nations Military Observer Group in India and Pakistan. They are already in Srinagar. They are already in Muzaffarabad. They are already in Rawalpindi. And they have also a camp office in Ori. 
I think they are not Pakistanis, they are not Indians, and I think most of them are not Muslims either. Uh, because I met the leader who is an African, so uh, Ghana. So I would say that please call them. They are an instrument under the United Nations resolutions. Let them observe that double fencing, electronic wire, uh, minefield, when a bird cannot even fly across, how did the uh, people supposedly came across? And if they have any intelligence or evidence, please share with us. Let them decide. Let, let we agree on that, that some international focus should be there. The Indus Mortis Treaty, we have said already that it will be an act of war because it's a violation of an international treaty. It's not just Pakistan, India. It's World Bank. Since 1960, signed by Nehru and Ayub Khan. So if you start doing that, we are a lower apparent. But don't forget one thing, sir. India is a lower apparent vis-a-vis -vis China. And the Brahmaputra River has its origins there. See, if you call the pot, uh, the cattle, the pot cannot call the cattle black, then it is going to boomerang on you. And that will be uh, uh, disastrous. The instrument of accession of Junagar is intact. But mind you, there's no instrument of accession in Kashmir. It does not exist. So you see, that should be very clear. And one last right, that you, uh, the question asked by the lady, uh, behind that gentleman. Yes, I agree. What is the incentive? The biggest incentive is that the failure to resolve Kashmir and improve relations with Pakistan is the single biggest obstacle to peace, security, stability in South Asia. It's an impediment to India's rise. It's an impediment to India's economic development. And I give you the example. If Kashmir had been solved, Shashi Tharoor would have been Secretary General of the UN. If Kashmir had been resolved, India would have been the nuclear suppliers group. If Kashmir had been resolved, India would have been a member of the UN Security Council permanent seat. But as long as you have disputes with neighbor, you have a lingering dispute under United Nations resolutions, which you have promised to implement and you are not implementing them for expediency reasons, you cannot be at the high table in the world of global politics. Thank you very much. And with that, do you thank have any you. closing words? Thank you very much. I know a lot of you have lingering questions and doubts, but there are. They can come to Pakistan to ask the questions, or they can meet us here. No. <laughs> thank you very much, and we appreciate all the questions.